Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. With this message, I am planning to begin a study of the book of James. So may, you may open your Bibles to James chapter 1. Over the next several months, the messages that I'll have will follow the words of this epistle that James wrote. Starting a study of a book in the Bible is a little bit like planning a trip. Wouldn't you like to go on a holiday right now? When we go on a trip, we want to know where we're going, how we will get there, and what we can expect to see once we arrive. We can plan ahead for some of the grand landmarks that we for sure don't want to miss. And I expect also along the way that we'll find some hidden treasures in spots that are off the beaten path if we're patient enough to take the scenic route. We'll be richly rewarded and come through the other side the better for it. So today as we embark on this study of the epistle of James, we'll begin by looking at some important questions. First, who is James, the author of this epistle? Secondly, what kind of person is James? And third, who is James's audience? And finally, why did James write this epistle? And we will investigate those four questions by the four phrases that we find in the first verse of James. James 1, 1, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. So there we have it. Four questions and four phrases to investigate today. The first one is James. James was a common enough name in the Bible times because it is the Greek name for the Hebrew, Jacob. There are several characters in the New Testament called James. I'll mention four of them. In Matthew 4.21, we read, And going on from thence, he saw, this is Jesus, he saw two other brethren, James the son of Zebedee, that's our first James, and John his brother in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them. James and John, sons of Zebedee, sons of thunder, along with Peter, James, and John, these three were the closest disciples of Jesus. There was another disciple of Jesus named James. Toward the end of the list, in Matthew 10, three of the disciples, James, the son of Alphaeus. That's our second James. Here's a man that Jesus had chosen to be one of his 12 closest disciples, but the Bible tells us very little about him. In Mark 15, 40, we read, There were also women looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Less. There's our third James, and of Joseph and Salome. Called James the Less doesn't mean that this James was inferior in some way to anyone else. He could have been shorter or younger than another James that he was being compared to. And then in Matthew 13, verses 54 through 56, we read, And when he, again this is Jesus, had come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, so they were astonished and said, Where did this man get his wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brothers, James, there's our fourth James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. And his sisters, are they now all with us? Where then, then did this man get all these things? So here we learn that Jesus had a brother named James. Could any of these four Jameses have been the author of the epistle, James? 
Well, we read in Acts 2, the second verse of Acts chapter 12, Acts 12, 2, then he, this is Herod, killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. So this was James, the son of Zebedee, who was one of the first martyrs killed by Herod during the time when the church was still fairly new, perhaps only about 10 years after the resurrection of Jesus. It's not out of the question that James, this James, the son of Zebedee, was the author of the epistle of James. But as we study this epistle, it seems rather unlikely that it could have been written this early on as was the time when James, the son of Zebedee, was martyred. So what do we know about the other three men named James? Could they have written this epistle? Well, a case can be made for James, the son of Alphaeus, and James the Less to both be the same person, one of Jesus' twelve disciples. James the son of Alphaeus might have been given the name, the nickname James the Less, to distinguish him from the, the other, the more conspicuous James, son of Zebedee. And indeed, some early church historians call the two Jameses, James the son of Zebedee, the greater, and James the son of Alphaeus the less. Well, a case can also be made that James the less and James the brother of Jesus now are one and the same person. According to the Bible verses that I read in Matthew and in Mark, each of these Jameses have a mother named Mary and a brother named Joseph. So it sounds reasonable enough that they could be the same. And finally, there's a figure from the 4th century, a church figure named Jerome, who insisted that James, the son of Alphaeus, James the Less, and James, who is called the brother of Jesus, are all three the very same person. Now, have I completely confused you? My head is spinning myself. I want to make it clear that it's far more important that we're convinced that this epistle is the word of the living God inspired by God. That's more important than we know exactly who the author is. And we cannot say with total certainty who the author is of the book of James. Believe me, there are many people who have questioned whether this book is really God speaking or whether it is some man-made um, production that was put out there years and years after most of the other books in the New Testament were written or after they were all written. And therefore, perhaps it is even unworthy of inclusion in the New Testament. But I believe that this epistle is the inspired word of God. And I also believe that James was written by someone, a James who was very close to God, very close to God who came in the flesh, Jesus Christ. So who could it be? I think, I think that it is probable that the author of this epistle that we're embarking on a study of is James, the son of Joseph and Mary, the brother of Jesus. And it may well be that he had a nickname, too, or a surname, but if he was, and that he was, the brother of Jesus is truly remarkable. The Jerome that I was talking about earlier needed a reason to make the claim that he did. This man did not believe that Jesus had any biological brothers. Maybe they were cousins or something like that. Jerome wrote his views in a writing that's called The Perpetual Virginity of the Blessed Mary. And Jerome taught falsely that it would have been impossible for a holy Mary to have children 
who had an earthly father. I believe what the Bible says, that after the miraculous birth of Jesus to the Virgin Mary, Mary was married to Joseph, her spouse husband, and along with her firstborn son Jesus, the Bible says that they had at least six children together, four sons and at least two daughters. So we have father and son, we have father and mother, and we have four sons, but five boys, five sons, and two daughters. These children all had Mary as their birth mother. Now Jesus has no earthly father. God is his father. But the Bible does say that Jesus lived in Nazareth with Joseph and Mary and that he was subject to them. It's interesting that I come from a home where there was a father and a mother. There are five of us brothers and I have two sisters. And it was a lively home. Those were good times growing up. So I can imagine how it must have been in those days in the home of Joseph and Mary. But imagine with me growing up in the home with Jesus. James, the brother of Jesus, never knew a day in his life without Jesus. His earliest childhood memories would have included Jesus. They were playmates together in the streets of Nazareth. They sat at the table and ate many of Mary's delicious meals together as a family. Jesus and James would have worked side by side with Joseph the carpenter. They studied the Torah together. James was the little brother of the 12-year-old Jesus who knew that he must be about his father's business. Did James and his other brothers talk with Jesus as boys do sometimes with their brothers about their dreams and goals for their future? Did James know? The Gospels tell us of times that during the public ministry of Jesus, the three years when he was traveling and teaching and healing, that sometimes Mary, his mother, and his brothers would show up. So they followed him sometimes. They heard his teaching. They saw his miracles. They knew his claim was that he is the Son of God. At the end of this time, at the end of these three years, these brothers, these younger brothers of the Messiah, had this attitude about Jesus that we find in John chapter 7, verse 5. These sad words, for even his brothers did not believe in him. It seems that Jesus embarrassed them. It seems that they were offended by him. It seems like they had run out of patience with him. They didn't believe him. After all those years of being with him, there are people who are just like Jesus' brothers. They've known him all their lives, but they've never really known him a day in their lives. Not really known him. Paul tells us that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again on the third day. He says that in 1 Corinthians 15. And he tells us there that among those who had the privilege of seeing Jesus, the resurrected Christ, in verse 7, after that he was seen of James. Jesus had a special appointment with James, his brother, who did not believe on him prior to his crucifixion. I believe it was on this day that James believed in his Lord Jesus Christ. This is the day that he began to really know Jesus. So for anyone who is listening who does, does not think that you can ever come to the place where you can believe Jesus, 
where you can ever be- believe in him or trust in him. And for all of you who are praying, perhaps for years for someone whom you love to come to know, to really know Jesus, I offer you James, the brother of Jesus, as an example of hope. I was recently encouraged by the testimony of an acquaintance of mine whom I've known for, I think, over 40 years. And for many, many years, this person lived with his back to Jesus, in defiance of Jesus. But in the last several years, my friend has come to Jesus, and he's living a faithful, victorious life. That's encouraging to me. But you know, James doesn't give us any of this in his, in his introduction, does he? Back in James 1, 1. He doesn't say something like this, the Honorable James, the oldest half-brother of Jesus, star witness of the resurrected Christ, senior leader of the first church in Jerusalem. Here I am, I'm offering you an autographed copy of my memoirs. Of course, for a small donation which you can give to my ministry. Thank you. No. Let's look at the next phrase. James calls himself a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. A bondservant. That's a willing for life time slave, really. That's what that means. See, James didn't introduce himself with any mention of his connection, his earthly, his biological connection to Jesus as his brother. He calls himself his slave. We like to drop hints about who we are and what we've done and what we're capable of doing. We like people to know. We have this little Miller family joke about our own family's claims to fame. We have a little list, but maybe it's some famous person we've met or someone we've worked for or someone we're a distant cousin to or Maybe it's about some accomplishment that we've achieved at one stage in our lives. It's kind of fun to subtly enter that information into a conversation. For for instance, did you know that my mother's first cousin is married to the son of a famous American actor? That's right. But is that a claim to fame? I don't think so. You know, it's so tempting to prop up our little selves with these piddling little claims to fame that we might drum up in our minds. The claim to fame that James had is that he is a bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ. What's yours? How did James serve his Lord? How did James do it? How did he willingly serve the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, James was there on the day of Pentecost, the birthday of the new church. And then sometime in those first years of the new church, James emerges as a leader in the church. There was that fiery preacher, Peter. There was that missionary, Paul. And there was James a leader, an administrator, and many, many others who served faithfully in the church, named and unnamed. But when when Peter, one of the leaders of the church at Jerusalem, to know about his miraculous release from prison, as told in in Acts uh, 12, he asked that the message would be sent to James and to the brethren. And when Paul, as a fairly new believer, first came to Jerusalem, there were two men that he needed to see. And he talks about that in Galatians. He went to see Peter and stayed at his house for 15 days. Then he says, but I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Paul needed that confirmation 
He needed that endorsement from these men because they were the ones whom God had called to lead the church. Years later, when Paul came back to Jerusalem to report in detail what God was doing among the Gentiles that he had met, it was James and it was to the elders that he told this joyful news. That's in Acts 21.18. James was the man who led out in that church meeting in Acts 15 when one of the first major challenges that faced the church about what the expectations for these new non-Jewish believers were to be. And this little speech that he gives in Acts 15, verses 13 through 21, contains language that is very comparable to some of what we'll be reading in this epistle that we're planning to study. Church history mentions one other thing about James. This is church history that's outside of the Bible. This is church tradition. But here it is that James was a man given to prayer and that he would kneel for hours on hard surfaces with no padding, praying for the church, praying for the believers, so much so that he developed thick calluses on his knees, and he received yet another nickname, Camel Knees. Camel Knees. Oh, you who would be a bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ today, What do your knees look like? That's a challenge to me. Is my prayer life a smooth prayer life? Are my knees smooth? What about yours? And James will teach us about prayer in this epistle, especially in chapter 5, verses 13 through 18. With all the other responsibilities that James had, the Lord inspired him to write an epistle, one epistle, Not two like Peter or 13 like Paul, but one. I'm thankful, aren't you, for this part of God's word. And I'm looking forward to learning from this humble bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, James stayed in Jerusalem all his life, as far as we know, serving the Lord while serving the church there. Did he ever have aspirations to be a missionary like Paul? Going to the far-flung regions of the world. But he stayed right there, serving where God had called him to faithfully serve. Are you willing to be a bondservant of Jesus Christ in that very place that God wants you to be right now? So, our third question is, who is James' audience? And he writes in this phrase, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Now that sounds very Jewish, doesn't it? Indeed, the first Christians were mostly former practicing Jews. And James' letter has Jewish overtones in it. He quotes from the Old Testament. His first readers were quite fluent in reading the Old Testament scriptures. He talks about the Ten Commandments. We see that in James chapter 2. His readers knew the Ten Commandments. He uses the examples, examples like Abraham and Isaac and Rahab and Job and Elijah. They knew these stories. He uses a term in Chapter 5, verse 4, Lord of Sabaoth. Now that's a classic Hebrew phrase, Lord of hosts. They would have understood that meaning. In chapter 2, verse 2, James mentions the places where their churches were meeting, calling their places an assembly. The word for assembly is synagogue. Indeed, the Jewish synagogues were the meeting places, the church houses of the Christian churches in those days. James goes on to mention that he's writing to a scattered church, a scattered abroad church. The word there, scattered abroad, is the word diaspora. 
And it means just what it sounds like. The dispersion or of the dispersion. These people were descendants of Jews who were taken from Israel and exiled in Babylon centuries before and were now resettled in communities in many foreign countries throughout the Roman Empire, not only in Palestine, but in the desert lands of the Middle East and along the northern parts of the African continent, in Asia Minor, and into Europe as far away as today's country of France. Some of these communities would become mission outposts as the gospel spread from Jerusalem to Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world. They also became havens of refuge for Christians who were being persecuted in their communities and driven from their homes to other places where perhaps it would be more suitable for them to live. In new territory, with new brothers and sisters in Christ. Imagine the joyful welcome of this epistle, of this letter, in these faraway communities. A letter from Brother James back in Jerusalem. It could well be said, it could well be that the letter that James wrote was the first scroll of the New Testament to be carefully added to the scrolls in their cabinets, in their synagogues that contained those Old Testament writings. The first writing that they saw in the New Testament era. It could possibly have been the very first of the New Testament books to be written around the, the uh, time of 45 A.D. Though we'll be studying this bit by bit, We'll be going through this epistle verse by verse. I would encourage you to read this letter in one sitting sometime. My sister in the United States writes us a letter about once a month, a real letter that comes in the post. It's an exciting day when that letter arrives. And when it comes, you can believe that we don't just read one sentence or one paragraph and then fold the letter up and read a little bit more the next day. No, we read the whole thing. There's benefit in reading this epistle all the way through. It takes about 20 minutes to read the book of James. So what is the theme of the book of James? I would have a hard time, I would have a really hard time choosing a theme verse. Maybe it would be chapter 1, verse 4, which we'll be looking at very soon. The last part of it, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Or maybe chapter 2, verse 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Or possibly chapter 3, verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. Or maybe 5, verse 7. Therefore... Be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until he receives the early and the latter rain. Maybe you have a favorite verse from James as well. But I think, perhaps, that the theme of this letter of James can be best captured with the last word of verse 1. The word is greetings. Now, this salutation of James is a lot different than the flowery greetings of the Apostle Paul that he gives in his epistles. Things like grace and peace from God the Father. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Beautiful words, Paul. Meaningful words, Paul. But James says, greetings. And that's all. Greetings. Now there is more behind this word, there's more to this word, than it just being a polite way to start a letter. It means a lot more than, how are you? This word means, please, be cheerful. You as my readers have a reason to rejoice. Now these readers have faced, are facing, and will be facing increasingly hard times. Persecution is not going to let up. Temptation is not going to let up. The devil is going to try to destroy them. But... James says to them, greetings.
have reason to rejoice. Chapter 5, verse 8, the coming of the Lord is at hand. This is a letter that tells Christians how to live in this world in which they are scattered into, in which they are dispersed into. There's 108 verses in the epistle of James. And in those verses, there are over 50, 50 imperative commands. Things that Christians need to do to live in this world. 108 verses and over 50 commands. James is not wanting us to just survive. He's wanting us to thrive. And this book, as I read it, seems fast-paced. As I read through it, it seems I'm just coming to grips with one concept and another one comes at me, and then another one, and then another one. But it's not a bunch of teaching thrown together. There's a flow through it, and I hope we'll be able to see that and feel that flow. There's a flow through this epistle of faith. There's a flow of grace and works. There's a flow of life. There's action here in James. I believe we'd agree that this epistle is not only for Jewish ears to hear. Because we know that from Acts, uh, from Acts that James was, was very involved in the integration of the non-Jewish believers into the church. And that's us. As time went on, the proportion of non-Jewish believers increased. And obviously today, most Christians that we know, most Christians around the world, are not of Jewish origin. But this is for us. It's for us today. History records many dispersions of Christians. People who have made their choices because of their commitment to Jesus Christ. Displaced people. Displaced for the rest of their lives from what had been normal. Now, in this new normal, they're still called out, called to live out their faith. Some recent figures from 2020. One out of every nine Christians last year lived in a country where there was a daily threat of external persecution. That's 250 to 300 million Christians who lived last year with that danger every single day. On average, last year, there were eight Christians killed every day. Eight Christians martyred for their faith. That's about 3,000 believers martyred for their faith that we know of. Now, we believers here are not experiencing that violent kind of external persecution. But we are, ironically, having a dispersion, a little mini-dispersion among us, aren't we? Due to the circumstances of our times in which we're living, our life routines have been changed. Our, some of our freedoms are temporarily on hold, and our future does not seem clear sometimes. What will happen tomorrow? What will happen next week? How will our next year be? Maybe with these uncertainties, maybe with these challenges that we're facing, maybe we can imagine just a little bit more today how it, what it must have been like and what it is like for many believers who have faced real persecution. Maybe our little inconveniences can help remind us to join in solidarity with and in prayer for persecuted Christians today. Maybe our light afflictions of today can help preserve us for that unknown tomorrow of living out our faith even more committedly as we're called to give our lives as bond servants, as willing servants of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
In part two of Pilgrim's Progress, John Bunyan writes a poem that was later modified and it was set to music for the English hymnal. I thought this poem's title was and is a fitting title for this message. The title is To Be to be a Pilgrim. These people of the diaspora, these people of the scattering abroad, were truly pilgrims. And today we're called to be pilgrims. So to my fellow pilgrims, I say with James, greetings. And to our fine singers, Thank you for indulging me in my request for you to sing this song that John Bunyan first wrote. 